most of what I have to say tonight, he did not mention. And it's kind of interesting that he wouldn't mention it because it, it comes right out of God's word. But when you start analyzing what he did say against what the Bible says, you will see why he probably chose not to say that, for there was good reasons in uh, his strategy. Now, one of the, uh, the reasons for this may have been that uh, when you look at the human family and you see that, uh, you know, in, in a crowd like would have occurred in Philadelphia or in uh, New York uh, or in Washington, uh, they, they would have been very mixed, representing people from all over the world, the human family. And there's so many of them, and if you really are interested in, in converts and numbers, then you got to speak kindly to these people. If you, wanna, if you want to make friends and you want to influence them in today's world, uh, speak kindly to them. Tell them things they want to hear. Make them feel good about themselves. But that's not the strategy of God's word. That's the human family. See, this is what God's up to. And look at how clearly it's stated here. The New Testament says that one of the things that Christians should do is be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be you separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, you can see two families in this. You can see the human family, which is the unbelievers, which the believers are called out from. When they come out from that family, then they have a different relationship to the Lord because now God is a father unto them and they are his sons and daughters. That uniqueness separates the human family from God's family. That's pretty plain to see, pretty obvious in the scriptures and illustrates something that you would think any Christian talking to the whole human family would point out. What God wants us to do is come out from that human family to be a separate people for him, for which he will be our father and we will be his sons and daughters. Like he uses the terms of a family, a father, sons and daughters. That's family language. I never heard him say anything about that. I don't know if you, you did or if you read anything, but I just think he, he missed it. He probably chose not to say it. So here's another aspect of, of which uh, I would have expected he would have said it because look at what the Word of God says. And this is going way back to Genesis 28 when he's speaking to the fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, in verses 13 and 14, Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, the God of Isaac, and the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. So you might guess, he's talking to Jacob. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, given an opportunity to talk to the world, because that's really what he did when he talked to the bodies that he addressed during the few days he was here, talking to the world, you would have thought he would have mentioned this group of people that the Bible is talking about here, which if people are related to it, they will be blessed. How could a man of the Bible miss that? But he did. And I wouldn't think he would ever speak about that based on what the Catholic Church's position is towards the Jewish people. But he's obviously speaking to Jacob and referring to Abraham and Isaac and talking about that in him and his seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. There needs to be an explanation of that to understand the Bible. Now, this is just a misleading statement. Based on what the Bible says, that you couldn't say that's anything other than a misleading statement. The church's relationship with the Muslims, 
the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslims. These profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge, on the last day. That's cleverly put, but misleading, because it would lead you to think that the Muslims really don't have to change anything. That in terms of God, well, God's going to reach out to them and he's going to bless them just like he does anybody else. And that seems to be the way the, the, the Pope led his discussions with the families of the world. In other words, they're, they're all welcome and there was no need to change. Oh, but that's not what the Bible says. That's so different than what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. This is what was preached in the first century. This is what the apostle Peter said or, or was, was working on. But in terms of, of what he said, it says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You wouldn't be too popular if you said that on the world stage. If you were to go into the United Nations and, and make this kind of a speech and say, we still believe this. If you people want salvation that are not Christian, you've got to become Christian. Well, that just wouldn't be too welcome in many parts of the world, especially if you're trying to influence people in other world religions. But that's the truth of the matter. Now, that would also be called bigoted today. That's a bigoted statement because that statement says this group is right and it's the only one that's right. But there is a time for bigoted statements. Like bigot, if you're called a bigot, you might think well, someone's talking to you in very derogatory language, but I tell you, you wouldn't mind being a bigot if, like I saw one day, going to work early one morning, uh, the road was blocked. You know, all the, all the fire engines and the police cars were out there, red lights everywhere. We had to get diverted off the road. So I didn't know what was going on. They couldn't see anything. But that night when I came back, the road wasn't blocked. And here was a house that was burned burn right out during the night. So I thought, well, you know, it'd be interesting to know just what happened there because, uh, uh, I sort of felt I knew those people. I'd been going by that house for years, driving to work and back from work. And I, you know, you see them working around the yard and then all of a sudden the house is burned out. So I read the paper and it said that there was a, a truck came up about four o'clock in the morning and noticed that there was a fire in this house. And he noticed the car in the front, in, in the front of the house. So he stopped his truck, he called the fire department and he went to the house and he uh, banged on the door as loud as he could. He said he, he couldn't get in, but he, he tried to make it apparent to anybody who was in the house that they, they needed to get to the door. When the fire people came, apparently it was too late to get into the house. The house was too much ablaze. But you see, he was concerned. There was a car in the driveway, and he was concerned that the people in the house might have been sleeping and didn't know their house was on fire. But that's pretty bigoted, isn't it? <laughs> For someone to go and hammer on your door, to get you out of bed, to come to your door? Don't you think that's kind of bigoted, that he thinks he knows something about you? Well, if your house is burning down, you wouldn't mind. He'd probably thank the person. Well, there really wasn't anybody in the house. They left their car out there to make people think there was someone in the house. You know what you do when you go away, you leave a car there so people will think there's someone in. And they were on the other side of the country. But I thought that really was an interesting thing because it gave an idea to support this concept, that there is a case for bigotry, a case when you want to make your case so strong that you're willing to, to rattle people's cage to get them to wake up about reality. And the reality is there isn't salvation in any other name given under heaven. So when the Catholic Catechism speaks about Muslims in such soft terms, oh, they worship one God and you know God will look upon them with compassion in the day of judgment. Where does he get that from? This is what Peter, supposedly the first pope, said. But the Catholic Church is drifting, 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 and it's drifting away even from its roots, its catechism. It's drifting from it. 
And this pope seems to be foremost in this by taking liberties with even the Catholic faith so that some of the conservatives of the ranks are a little bit disconcerted by this. The Bible states very clearly to the Christians, as it is at the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus said to the, the disciples, go you into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. So the idea is to preach the gospel. Well, if you wanted to know what the gospel is, you'd have to get the Bible out and see all the things that the Bible speaks about as being part of the gospel. There's quite a number of them. It's quite a, quite a large component of material in the New Testament is related to what Peter, the Apostle Paul, and the Lord Jesus Christ taught, what was the good news of the kingdom and the things concerning Jesus Christ. And to the person that believes that and is baptized shall be saved. So what good are you doing to a Muslim beside, by, by saying that they're okay? What, what's the use of going and telling an atheist, well, you know, God will be compassionate. And in the time of his judgment, uh, he, he, will, uh, he will look favorably. Those are, I would never want to say that. I can't imagine that anybody would want to speak on God's behalf without thinking what you're saying. We go out to preach the gospel that's revealed to us because there's only one gospel that can say, dare not say something different according to what we read in the first passage or in, the, in those passages. Now, you'd also think that maybe the Pope would have referred to this, though I can understand the sensitivity of going too much into the Old Testament and becoming, you know, just a little bit too close to the Jewish people because of this, because this was all part of the Pentateuch. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 to 6, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of Yahweh be kindled against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto Yahweh thy God, and Yahweh thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Now, we don't question God. We don't say, well, we, we don't like what you said here, so we, we just won't believe it. I mean, not anybody that would really understand who God is. You, just, you would never take a position like that. So we're taught by these things. Then when God said this to the Jewish people, thou art a holy people unto Yahweh thy God, he's chosen you to be a special people that we might look at these people and say there's something special about the Jews. God chose them to be a special people unto themselves. Now, when you look a little further into this and you see that the Jews are God's witnesses, they're not independent in the sense that, you know, if they choose to witness, like Jehovah's Witnesses choose to witness for God, they claim then to be God's witnesses, not the Jews. It doesn't matter whether the Jews want to be God's witnesses or they don't want to be God's witnesses. They are God's witnesses by all the things that God has said about them. They witness to the fact that God is God. They don't witness to the fact that they're godly. They witness to the fact that God was able to say what their future was 2,500, almost 3,000 years ago when it comes to these passages. And he's never changed. He has dealt with them according to his word and he will continue to do so. So in Ezekiel 37, uh, Bible students are very happy about this because this happened in our days. No, not the days of everybody that's here tonight, but in the days of many of us, we saw this happen. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, whither they be gone, and gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. Well, 1948... They became a nation. They hadn't been a nation since A.D. 70. Almost 2,000 years, no nation. We are a privileged generation to be able to see the open work of God with his people Israel. 
I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. If you just looked a little bit of the, of the number of places that the world nations had, had uh, world, uh, the nations of the world rather, had thought of where they were going to put the Jews. Well, there was places in Canada where they thought they'd put the Jews. They were planning a home for them there. And there's all places around the world. But the word of God said, on the mountains of Israel. And when the word of God said that, not only did they go back to that place, but they also called it Israel. Because it hadn't been called Israel for, I don't know if, uh, if it ever had been called Israel in that sense. We, not, we do not yet see one king, king to them all, but we expect that will happen. We do see them no longer being two nations, Israel and Judah, but they won't be divided anymore, as he says. Neither will they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. You want to talk about family relationships? You need this or you're leaving something out. When God speaks about a nation, a group of people in the world, and he says, they will be my people, and I will be their God, and you're on the world stage talking to people from all these nations, why wouldn't you say something as plain as that? Well, it's not expedient. It's, uh, it's not going to make him or the Catholic Church any better off to say that. It draws attention to someone else altogether. I hate this politicizing of religion. Only saying things because it's expedient to say it for your own well-being. That's not proper. You did, you'd witness for God based on what he says. And those other things aren't supposed to be there at all. But let's look at this. Because this is drawing it a little closer out of Jesus' own statements. In Matthew 12, verses 46 to 50. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother. Now you know what the Catholics make about his mother. Hey, she's, in their mind, the mother of God. She is the highest person you can intercede with to get what you want. Well, it was Jesus' mother, Mary, and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then one said to him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto them, or unto him that told him, Who is my mother? Who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother. Well, he must have meant that in a different way than, than literally. He wouldn't point to a man and say, You're my mother. So you can see what he's trying to point out here. My mother and my brethren. Whosoever will do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Now you think the Pope might have said that. He's the man who's supposed to be the vicar of Christ. He's the person replacing Christ before the people today. And he won't say what Jesus said, that rather than draw attention to his literal mother and his literal brethren, he's drawing attention to the people who believe in his father. Well, they come from all kinds of families. They come from every race upon the earth, families upon the earth that you can suggest. There are people there that they come out to say, yeah, God's my father. And my brothers and sisters and my mother, my family relations now are those who have the same father. That's the sense of the family life that Jesus talked about. So there's new family members. And, you know, I know and you probably know of a few people had to pay a dear price to do this. A dear price. Well, I know a couple of Catholics in our ecclesia who have had to leave everything. Leave mom, leave dad, leave brothers and sisters, leave the whole family to come out and to be part of God's family. That's a terrible price to have to pay, especially when you brought all these kids up and you know all your brothers and sisters and now you're going a different way. But look at what he said. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. So you see, the Lord 
like the Bible, is calling people out of something. They've left these things to become this. And that's the idea that of, the, of God's family coming out of the human family. These people getting out of things so that they might be in something else and, and choose uh, brethren and sisters and mothers and children that are truly part of this new family. That's the idea. Oh boy, that's a, an amazing passage. Matthew 10, verses 34 and 37. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. Did the Pope ever talk anything about this? What did Jesus mean? He's talking to families. And, and the God, word of God says, I didn't come to send peace on earth. I came uh, not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, how anybody could speak about the family and not mention this, I do not know. You're just leaving out Christianity. That's exactly the way the gospel works. It will take hold in someone's mind in your family. And it has nothing for someone else in your family. They don't see it. They don't have any interest in it. And all they want to do is something that is so far removed from the Bible, you just can hardly believe it. Brought up in a family that honored the Bible. And then you'll find someone who, who comes out of some other family and, and they grab a hold of the gospel and they will not let go. And they are going to love the gospel and, and what they're called to far more than anything related to their original family. If you understand that, you're a little prepared for what life is going to offer you because that's what life does offer us when we buy into the gospel. It's a power. I mean, being convinced of something and being convicted that this is what's going to happen on the earth and, and seeing things with the certainty that's missing in this world out there because you've been reading the Bible and you believe that this God, whose name is Yahweh, which means I will either do something or, or be something, it, he speaks in those terms. God never talks in terms, well, I may do this, or I may do that, or I'm thinking about this, or I haven't made up my mind in that. God doesn't speak in those terms. He tells us what he will do. And that's why we fear our God. We don't fear him because we're going into a dark room or we're just not sure what's going on in this room and the fear is you know, getting to us and we're trembling about it. We fear our God because we know what he will do. And we respect him and we honor him because what he said, he will do. And so we believe it and we follow it. Well, let's go back a little further. Go back into marriage and talk about a little bit about marriage and what the Pope did have to say about marriage. Because this is something that God set up very, very quickly. Uh, I mean, we find it in Genesis chapter 2. And it, it is so distinct, so different than anything we might have even imagined that we have to imagine and, and work in, in, in God's words to, to, uh, to see if we can, what he had in mind here. So it says, the Lord God, this is Genesis 2, verses 21 to 24, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Well, so much for evolution. And you can't believe evolution and believe this. You mean that God would make out of a, a man by taking a rib out of him and make his wife in his own lifetime and bring her to him, which would seem to be in a very short time, bring her to him as a mature woman to be his wife in the lifetime of the two? There's nothing in evolution that's compatible with that view. We are compelled by the first few chapters of Genesis to discard that idea. 
And when people will start allowing that and have to say, well, he didn't really mean this, or this, this really, you know, this is part of the mystery of the word. We don't really know what he's saying. You're just leaving out something that's very easy to understand. He, God made a woman, and he made her a woman just like that. That's what God can do and what God did. But what he had in mind, we find revealed to us much later in the word of God, back in, uh, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, what he really had in mind when he was doing this and how he was referring to the, uh, the church, which was uh, to, to be rep represented by uh, this formation of a woman. Well, what is the papal position? Now, I noticed this in the Hamilton Spectator, because I was reading in our own paper at home, and I, I was looking on this, and, and this, this writer, I've already alluded to it in a former uh, address, uh, she went through and she was able to find out what the church taught on a number of things. So I was quite interested in this one. What, what is the official position on divorce, or at least in Francis's ideas of it? Well, it says Francis has divided the church by opening debate on whether divorced and civilly remarried Catholics can receive communion. Church teaching holds that without a church-issued annulment, Declaring the initial marriage invalid, these Catholics are committing adultery and thus cannot receive the sacrament. Francis has called for a more merciful approach, insisting that these Catholics are not excommunicated and must be welcomed into the church. Well, it, it's kind of interesting that he would take that, but this is the Pope that we're presently dealing with. He's, he's different in the sense that he seems to be actually uh, taking Catholic teaching, never mind biblical teaching, Catholic teaching and revising it. Because this is the Catholic teaching on this subject. Unity and indissolubility and openness to fertility are essential to marriage. Polygamy is incompatible with the unity of marriage. Divorce separates what God has joined together. The refusal of fertility thus turns married life from its supreme gift, the child. Now that's probably going to haunt the Catholics. Because the way this world is going, they don't recognize, it seems, any longer that marriage must be confined to a man and a woman. Well, you can hardly get fertility out of a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. I mean, only common sense teaches us that. So if this is the definition, and this is what the, ch the church teaches, they're, they're going to either in trouble or they're just going to ignore what their own teaching is. But not Jesus. You see, here's Jesus, and, and this is thousands of years after Genesis. And people ask him about marriage and divorce. And he says in Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6, He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain or two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And all he did was quote what God did in the very first few chapters of, of Genesis. So Jesus was very clear. Nothing had changed. God's view was to be upheld. What God's joined together, let not man put asunder. But what would be worse in a marriage when people are, are planning or, or have this, this out sort of, I don't know whether it'd be a clause, I don't know if people actually write it in as a clause, but if things don't work out, we're out of here. God never gave people that opportunity. And I remember, because I have six daughters, and I had to go through every, you know, this marriage with every one of them. And I would tell the young man involved, this is for life. If it's not for life, find somebody else. Don't choose my daughter. If you're going to marry her for life, you're going to be with her for thick or thin until death parts, fine. Welcome into the family. But otherwise, no. My answer is no. I will not uh, comply with this. So that's just what I would think would fall to any man who has a daughter, that if the man is, is going to respect this statement, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder, then you don't even have it as an option. It never occurs to your mind. 
And I've known some people have had to put up with, with uh, sicknesses that, that developed in, their, in the very first year of marriage. And uh, it, it lasted as long until one of them died and they would not give up. They were faithful servants because of the way the Word of God puts it. Well, what's the papal position on gay relationships? Well, this is what this writer said. Francis famously, famously uttered, who am I to judge? Now, that's going to be an interesting statement. Okay, we're going to hear about that because that's the statement he made with concerning gay relationships and, and people won't let him forget it. When asked in 2013 about a Vatican Monsignor who reportedly or purportedly had a gay lover in his past, many took the comment to be a sweeping new opening by the church toward gays, as Francis has urged the church to be less judgmental and more merciful in welcoming saints and sinners alike. Asked about his position on homosexuality later, Francis stressed that when he said, who am I to judge, he was merely repeating church teaching. And he responded with a question of his own. When God looks at a gay person, who does he endorse? The existence of this person with love or reject and condemn this person? We must always consider the person. But while he has met on several occasions with gays and even counseled a transgender couple, Francis hasn't changed official a church teaching that while gays should be treated with dignity and with respect, homosexual acts are intrinsically uh, disordered. You have to read that a few times just to figure that out, what that's saying. But I think you get the gist of it. And I tell you, they didn't tell you everything. You go into a court of law, I think what they tell you is, if you're going to be a witness, we want you to tell the truth. We want you to tell nothing but the truth. And we want you to tell the whole truth. That's not the whole, it's not even the whole truth of what the Catholic position is that you should say that. But it, it, it wasn't expedient. You see, it wasn't politically correct to say that at that time. Here's the official Catholic teaching. Basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as an acts of grave depravity, tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. That's, that was what was quoted. But they are contrary to natural law. They close the sexual act to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a genuine effective and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstances can they be approved. That's Catholic teaching. But even the writer didn't quote that. She must have known what the, what the, uh, the catechism said, but didn't quote that herself. Under no circumstances can they be approved. I don't know what kind of a world we're living in. I mean, it, people are changing things. There doesn't seem to be anything that people are holding on to and saying, that's where I stand, and I'm not moving. That's, that's my position. Now, positions move. They move, and they move, and they always move in the same direction. It, it would seem to me that, that some of these laws that we find in nature are very applicable to the human mind as well. And the idea that, you know, you know everything is, is going down, uh, they call it entropy. I don't know if you know anything about entropy. You don't have to know anything about entropy. But entropy is just to explain that, that things that, that are built up, that took a lot of energy to get there, will just gradually in life decay. So your car, your beautiful new car, leave it outside long enough and it will just gradually decay until it goes back and rusts back into the ground. That's entropy. And it seems to be the same with what people's positions are. Like if you're not exercising it, if you're not keeping it sharp, if you're not out there doing what God says, it's not long before you compromise on these things. Oh, we'll just go this far with it. We won't say this much anymore. That's not good. The Bible is very definite on this. Know you not, it says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now that is very instructive. 
If anybody really wants to be Christian, you could hardly say you're at odds with this statement. Because he says, don't be deceived. In other words, the likelihood is that you will be deceived. That you will think, this, oh, that applies to other people. It doesn't apply to me. Like, my circumstances are different. I could actually do this and get away. That's not what the Word of God says. And if we need to explain these words anymore, another version would, it would give us exactly the terms we use today about this idea of being effeminate or abusers of, our, of themselves with mankind. So those actions are condemned and people should be assured that if you do them, you won't be in the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God to the Catholics is the church. And they're allowed in the church because he welcomes sinners and saints alike, as he says. So you get one thing wrong, you get another thing wrong, you have a confusing message for the public, and it's pretty hard to explain how they love them. I can only think it's just how little people know about the Word of God that this is happening on the world stage. Now here's something else. You remember, I, I mentioned in a former address that having gone to a Catholic church when the, the priest was taking the young people around and he was showing them what actually happens in what looked like a cage. And it was actually a confession box. And he talked about confession. The only way you can have your sins forgiven is you've got to confess them to a priest. Well, look at what it says. This is out of the Catechism. Confession to a priest is an essential part of the sacrament of penance. All mortal sins of which penitence, after a diligent self-examination, are conscious of must be recounted by them in confession, even if they are most secret and have been committed against the two last precepts of the Decalogue. For these sins sometimes wound the soul, uh, wound the sore more grievously and are more dangerous than those which are committed openly. I think that should be soul. And, are, uh, and those are committed openly. So th this idea is big to the Catholics, very big, that you have to confess to a priest. Well, if you've locked up confession to have your sins forgiven you in the Catholic Church, what's it say for Christian Elphians? You never had your sins forgiven you. Because the Catholics say you can only get forgiveness when you confess to a priest. If that's, if, if that's the way it's marketed and that's the way it's bought by people, and the Catholic Church is obviously going to bring everybody back to the Catholic Church because you would want your sins forgiven. I never find anything like that in the Bible. You don't find any confession to a priest in the New Testament. You find, as Jesus said in prayer, we ask our Father to forgive us our sins. You find that he says that your sins are only forgiven if you forgive other people. But there's nothing about confessing to a priest. People don't open the Bible. They will never know the truth, and they will just be victims of this kind of teaching. Widespread corruption. Well, this is the book I read, and I would not recommend that you read it. That means you probably will. But it, it's, a, it's an interesting book because it, it's, it's, the, it's the ideas of a priest who worked in the confession box till he was so sick of it, he got out of Catholicism. And this is a little bit of what he said. It was not very long after my ordination when a priest came to me to confess the most deplorable things. He honestly told me that there was not a single one of the girls or married women whom he had confessed who had not been a secret cause of the most shameful sins in thoughts, desires, or actions. But he wept so bitterly over his own degradation his heart seemed so sincerely broken on account of his own iniquities that I could not refrain from mixing my tears with his. That's the nature of the book about a priest who is talking about life in the confessional box. It's just, it's just too awful to read. We don't want to get into confession to a man. We confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. And that's all. We don't need to confess things of that nature to any man. People don't listen to the Bible, don't follow what it teaches, they pay the penalty. Well, the Bible did speak of this kind of language. You see in every Revelation chapter 18, verse 23, and the light of a candle shall, no, shall shine no more at all in thee. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, 
by thy sorceries were all nations to see. Well, what is this idea of sorceries? Well, that's what Strong says for it. You get the, the, um, an interesting relationship to pharmacy or medication. You don't know when you're going down to get, go to a pharmacy to get some medication, you're going to a sorcerer. But like, there is some connection in language, at least. And the idea of magic. <laughs> you sort of wonder, what am I buying when I buy this medicine? Is it, is it uh, you know, how is it associated? Well, I don't think you need to make much of that. But that's the word, and that's where it's, it's rooted. And deceived is always the idea of, of, a, of a word that comes from planet. Now, the planets that, that don't follow a circular orbit or an elliptical orbit, it's, it's hard to find out where they are because they don't follow something that's really true. So it, it stood for something that roams, something that goes astray, something that deceives. Just interesting how language you pick up those ideas. But that's what he's referring to when he says, By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. But this is what I would like to ask a priest. You see, Jesus was challenged when he went into a situation uh, where he, he was going to deal with a sick man. And he, he volunteered to the man, your sins be forgiven you. And the people found fault with him. Like, who can forgive sins but God alone? So he said, well, that you might know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, arise, take up thy couch, and go unto thine house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Well, the Pope is chief priest. Pontifex Max, chief priest. If the chief priest before United Nations had been able to show that he could heal somebody, he could have proved by that, at least with these two verses connected, that he could forgive sins. If priests can't do any healing, how do we expect that they can forgive sins? But it seems that the Catholics don't ask that question. They just go into the confession box and carry on what's been going on for centuries. Whereas the Bible, if they read it, oh, they'd have questions about that. How is it that Jesus could do this and, and the priest that's confessing me can't? That would be one of the questions you'd want to ask. All the, the good things happen when people start to read their Bibles. When they close the Bible and just listen to these people, they become victims of it. Now, this is what God wants to do with the family. Okay, if we, Acts 15 verses 13 and 14, one of the wonderful verses that Christadelphians love because it tells you the purpose that God has with the human family. So if you're standing in front of the human family, you might want to mention something like this, that, that as it, it says in, in this conference in Jerusalem in Acts 15, verse 13, after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. That's the object. When a person speaks in the name of God, boy, that's certainty. You don't expect anything else to happen except exactly what God said would happen when a person speaks in the name of God. Now we know how in the, in the days of the prophets and the days of the kings that some of these people got that very wrong. And they had false prophets going out and speaking in the name of Yahweh, but then, you know, nothing happened. And the people were getting very confused by that. And God didn't speak very highly about those people because to speak in God's name or a people for his name is God's purpose with you and with me. With you and with me. God's purpose is to take out of the family, the human family, a people for his name. And you can see that from our very first quotation. Come out from among them and be separate. That's what God wants. A people for his name that honor his word, that take their instruction from his word and are not persuaded by these things, these writings of man. Now, I'd just like to draw this to a conclusion with this rather puzzling thing because the Roman Catholics will come back to, at you fairly strong on this if you push them. This is a a dialogue between uh, Peter and Jesus in which the Roman Catholics think that it proves that Peter was the first pope, that he was chosen 
by Jesus to be Pope, and he was the first of many. So Jesus asked his disciples, Whom do you say that I am? And Peter, right away, as he did in many cases, answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, the Catholics see that, and they say, well, that's, that's uh, Peter, and he's going to build this upon Peter. Now, you have to see the reasoning of why they would say that he will build his church upon a rock and mean Peter. That's, that's what they think. See, cause, because, you see, he went on to say that thou art Peter, uh, well, uh, uh, yes, and upon this rock I will build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So they say, oh, well, you'll see Peter received these keys. Nobody else received the keys. Therefore, uh, Peter must be the one that, that uh, he chose. Well, there we are. Like we showed you this diagram. There's, there's the keys. This is supposedly Peter. There's the keys, right in front of the Vatican. Everybody comes up, sees this. There's Peter with the keys. So what's behind this must be authentic, because that's what Jesus said to him. So it's up to Bible students to sort this out. Did Jesus really give this authority to Peter? Well, look at the official Catholic teaching on this. It says, the Lord made Simon alone whom he named Peter, the rock of his church. He gave him the keys of his church and instituted him shepherd of the whole flock. The office of binding and loosing uh, was also to, oh, I'm not too sure I got that one right. Uh, binding and loosing was to give Peter also a sign to the church of the apostles united to its head. So I've messed this up a little bit, but you can get it on this number 881. Uh, this pastoral office of Peter and the other apostles belongs to the church's very foundation is continued by the bishops under the primacy of the Pope. Now, what I wanted you to see in this was what the Catholic Church says, that the Lord made Simon alone, whom he named Peter, the rock of his church. Well, did he? You've got to go to Strong's or to any other concordance to find out what, what he really meant when he interchanged these words, Peter and rock. So in Matthew 18, I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock. Well, the word Peter, incidentally, means rock, a piece of rock. So it's interesting to see that he would say rock underneath it, but the word rock doesn't mean a piece of rock. It's a huge mass of rock. And of course, if you understand the idea of the building of the church, that there are stones that are fitted together, there is a, a cornerstone, and then there's a whole lot of other stones that fit into that cornerstone. So there's a significant difference, and Protestants have made this point to Catholics for centuries, and, and Catholics have made it to Protestants, no, we don't believe what you're saying. The fact there that these two words are very different is significant, very significant in the interpretation. Well, this is what I think is the clue of it, that when you find people baptizing, did they baptize in the name of Peter? Did they baptize with reference to Peter? Did they bring in the people into the church by saying, do you acknowledge that Peter is the, is the rock? He, he is the, is the, uh, have, has the keys to the church? Well, in Acts 8, it says, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Where's the continuity? Well, Peter had said, when Jesus asked him, who do you think Christ is? He says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It was based on the confession of Peter that Jesus would build his church, not on Peter. 
And that's why the rock, the little rock, and the big rock, the word Petra and Petros are different in the Greek. They mean different rocks altogether. This is the rock that the apostles built on. They didn't call Peter uh, it, it, you know, into the equation in any sense at all. It was just, what do you believe concerning Jesus Christ? That's a very difficult may, uh, point to make to Catholics. Now, in conclusion, I would just like to say that there's just a whole lot of other things. I don't think you would ever find the Pope talking about this. You would hardly find any church talking about this. Christadelphians have to be careful on this. This is what he said, Paul said to Titus, concerning the ecclesias that were set up in Crete. As for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, dignified self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God be not reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Well, how do you think it would go over if the Pope said that at the United Nations? that women are to be working at home, submissive to their own husbands. But that's what the Word of God says. And for women who are looking at this and who want to do what the Word of God says, then this is meaningful. And it's up to us to work it out, how that's done, how we do that in our home. But to go along with the world and just say, no, that's, not, that's, uh, that's Paul in the first century. Uh, women can, you know, do anything that men can do, and so, you know, let's move on, and, and maybe we can, we can lead the men. That's not what God had in mind. I just say when you come to talk about the family, and you're representing God in the picture, and you don't say what God says, it can't be good for that person or that organization in the future. So there's a few things about the family, which we would hope that you can see the difference anyway between God's family and the human family and how God wants his family to come out of the human family and be separate. In our last talk, Jerusalem, not Rome, we want to just deal with where we are prophetically. There's real significance to the Putin, to Putin, the leader of Russia, and the Pope meeting together to discuss strategy. That's really recent stuff. And in, the ages, uh, in the age of communism, when I was uh, you know, in my younger years, and we're looking at Russia through the, the, the eye of communism, there was no concern about this because they didn't want anything to do with the church. But Putin is just moving very much towards having the church like uh, or, uh, having the church in a position like it, it is in America, but maybe even stronger than it is in America. And uh, when he visits with the Pope and they, they dialogue, you might guess there's something in the wind. And that's what we'd like to talk about tomorrow. Thank you.